Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back for lunch. Uh, I'm Michael Fiedner from the Asian Research Institute and the Department of History at the National University of Singapore. And I'm very happy and quite honored today to be able to introduce our plenary session on Inter-Asia Then and Now. Uh, building upon the conversations that have been developing through the previous conferences, this session is going to try to take stock of some cutting-edge work on inter-Asian studies that cut across both diverse fields of area studies uh, and disciplinary approaches. In doing so, we're really fortunate today to be able to have with us three eminent scholars whose work has each, in a different way, made a landmark contribution to the study of inter-Asian connections. They bring to the conversation not only a great breadth of, and depth of knowledge of specific areas of West, South, East, and Southeast Asia, but also a truly interdisciplinary range of methodological approaches spanning art history and architecture, economic history, anthropology, literature, and history. Uh, each speaker will have about 25 minutes, uh, and then we'll follow in one uh, uh, single block of conversation thereafter. Uh, I just want to take, I don't want to take away time from them speaking, but just to briefly introduce our three speakers in order of appearance today. Our first is Professor Barry Flood, coming from New York University, uh, who is uh, one of, I think, one of the most sort of dynamic and interesting art historians working uh, on the Muslim world today, especially with his uh, most recent book, Objects of Translation. Uh, He's working on various other projects that I won't uh, read off his CV or anything, uh, but he is going to present us with some material that I think will really sort of again further challenge the border of where Asia starts and where Asia stops. Our second speaker today will be uh, Professor Takeshi Hamashita, uh, a very distinguished economic historian who is currently the Dean of the uh, School of Asia and Pacific Studies at Sun Yat-sen University, uh, not too far from here in Guangzhou. Uh, and his work has made really important contributions to our, our understanding of the trade networks and the tributary system that linked areas of East and Southeast Asia. And our third speaker today is Eng Seng Ho, uh, professor of both history and anthropology at Duke University, uh, whose uh, really groundbreaking work on Arab and Muslim diasporas across the, uh, across the Indian Ocean and their interactions with uh, colonial polities in, in the modern period. Uh, was published in his uh, remarkable book, The Graves of Turin. I won't take up any more time. I just suggest that you all go out and read the things that these three remarkable scholars have written. It's helped me a lot to just get a handle on the field over recent years. And I'll turn things over to our first speaker, Eric Flynn. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to begin by uh, thanking the organizers very much for the invitation. It's a great honor to, uh, to be here. Um, and also to, uh, by thanking Hong Kong University, the, the staff and students, faculty and students, for all they've done to look after us during our, our stay. It's really been remarkable. Um, I should begin by saying I'm, I'm a pre-modernist. I work on periods that are much uh, prior to those that most of you are familiar with. I work uh, essentially in, my interests lie in the pre-Mongol world system, not, not a very happy term, but exchange <laughs> circulation in the pre-Mongol world. I'm an Islamicist. I work in the western half of Asia as a work from India across to uh, uh, East Africa and the Middle East. I'm also a historian of material culture. Of, uh, I, I, uh, I teach in an art history department. I'm not particularly hung up on what counts as art, um, but you'll be glad to hear I haven't chosen pot shards and coins to show you this afternoon. I've chosen some, some uh, pretty things. Um, but I'm interested in what material culture can tell us about those um, questions of circulation in the past. Let me begin. In the spring of 2006, an article appeared in The Guardian, a liberal British newspaper, in which an Oxford historian pondered the raison d'etre of the socio-cultural malaise currently afflicting Europe. The problem, the writer concluded, was not cultural difference in itself, but rather the effect of global mobility, a peculiarly modern inability of human subjects to stay in place, or at least to abandon their cultural baggage as they migrated. He wrote, for centuries there's been a good rule for the coexistence of civilizations. It said, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. 
Globalization has undermined that rule. Because of mass migration, peoples and their cultures are physically mixed up together. Rome is no longer Rome, it's also Tunis, Cairo and Tirana. Birmingham is also Kashmir and the Punjab, while London is all the world. It's peculiarly Anglo-centric take on, on this kind of thing. Um, in both content and spirit, these sentiments represent a, a particularly Anglo-centric take on Samuel P. Huntington's well-discussed notion of a contemporary clash of civilizations, central to which is a marked contrast between the mobility of modern populations and their more sedentary predecessors. This afternoon, I want to introduce some things that challenge these notions of a prelapsarian time, a golden age when people knew their place and cultures were marked by a fixity of identity essential to intercultural harmony. I emphasize things because one of the problems, I would argue, is associated with many attempts to recuperate histories of pre-modern circulation, encounter, and mobility, um, is their almost exclusive reliance on inscriptions and texts uh, for their narrative reconstructions of the past, with material culture often wheeled on in a supporting or supplementary capacity. The dominance of a textual paradigm has, I would argue, obscured the potential of material culture to highlight aspects of mobility that were neither noticed nor necessarily of interest to most of the pre-modern chroniclers, geographers, and their audiences. So it gives us a different kind of take on pre-modern uh, mobility and circulation. While acknowledging the value of text to historical, as historical documents, by placing an equal emphasis on material culture, I want to draw attention not only to the different kinds of data that might be recovered from it, from material culture, but ultimately, to draw attention to the need to read between and beyond both texts and things in the narrative reconstructions of the interspaces of pre-modernity that often prove particularly elusive to the modern historian. Focusing on two quite distinct moments and places and two divergent kinds of archive, what I'd like to do in the short time available to me is to sketch in a rather impressionistic way how material culture and discourses concerning it may help us reimagine histories and historiographies of encounter, through which cultural geography and the boundaries, crossings, fixities, and fluidities that they imply are articulated, defined, and imagined. The things that I've chosen come from two very different contexts. One is a series of 9th century cast metal objects from an archaeological site in the southern part of what today is Pakistan, the other is a pair of 12th century paintings in a small church built in a cave in the highlands of Ethiopia. And you may think, what has Ethiopia got to do with inter-Asia? But this will, I hope, become clear. My first case study concerns materials that can be used to supplement and expand upon narratives of encounter contained in texts. My second concerns materials that reveal histories of circulation that are unacknowledged and undocumented in contemporary textual sources. The first case study comes from the Sindh region of what today is southern Pakistan, so from this area here, which in the 19th century was part of the uh, quote-unquote universal empire of the Abbasid caliphs centered in Baghdad. In the 19th and 10th century, Sindh lay on the eastern frontier of the Abbasid caliphate of Iraq, then an empire that stretched from the Atlantic in the west to the western borders of China and the Indus River in the east. The two major urban centers of Sindh were Multan in the north up here, and Mansura in the south, which is what I'm going to be talking um, about. Both were ruled by quasi-independent emirs who seem to have modeled their court cultures on both the courtly traditions of Abbasid Iraq and the court cultures of their Hindu neighbors to the east, particularly the, the Gurja Pratiharas and the Rashtrakutas of Peninsular uh, India. During this period, the ports of Sindh were major trade emporia, part of a global trade network characterized by what might be termed a mercantile cosmopolitanism that connected Basra and other ports in southern Iraq and the Gulf with ports in Sindh, the west coast of India, and ultimately the southern coast of China. During the 9th and 10th centuries, the activities and renown of the Sindhi merchants stretched as far west as the coast of East Africa. 
In both Sindh and the Arab emporia of East Africa, silver coins, tiny silver coins, struck to an Indian rather than an Abbasid standard, grease the wheels of long distance trade. These tiny African and Sindhi coins, you could fit four of them on the nail of my thumb. Um, and they, these were these circulated in both Sindh and the Arab Emporia of East Africa. The tiny uh, African and Sindhi coins weigh around, around 0.5 of a gram and are probably modeled on coins struck by the Hindu rulers of Gujarat in Western India. A reminder of the way in which these trans-regional trade contexts inflected the material culture of the Indian Ocean littoral. We have an unusual number of accounts of the cultural and economic life of Sindh, left by 10th century geographers, sailors, and travelers, and by the sedentary scholars who derived vicarious benefit from their experience sitting in these uh, coastal cities, port cities of southern Iraq, interviewing, um, as early, in an early case of ethnography, as it were, interviewing sailors who had made the trip to India and to uh, China. And what we get from these are compilations of seafaring tales that weave together maritime lore, tales of the fabulous, ethnographic observation, and historical detail. Some sense of the mobility between the ports of China, Sindh, Gujarat, and the west coast of India may be gleaned anachronistically from a 13th century image of a ship with Arab or Persian passengers sailing to Oman but staffed by Indian sailors the image that you see here. Communities of such Indians are reported to have resided in the ports of southern Iraq, finding their corollary in the diaspora communities of Arab and Persian traders who lived in under the rule of the Rashtrakuta Rajas on the uh, west coast of India, so strictly speaking outside the, the Dar al-Islam, outside the lands under the political control of the Abbasid Caliphate. Recent archaeological finds at the site of uh, Sanjan, here north of Mumbai. Interestingly, these archaeological excavations are funded by the uh, Parsi communities of Western India, looking at the um, archaeological remains to, that might corroborate these textual accounts of trade relations in the Abbasid period. Um, these recent archaeological excavations at Sanjan have produced evidence to substantiate these links between the Rashtrakuta ports and the Persian Gulf including significant quantities of 9th and 10th century Abbasid lusterware vessels. And I should emphasize lusterware uh, is a kind of ceramic which is developed in the 9th century in Iraq that uh, represents a major technological revolution. So this is the really high quality ceramic of its day, of the 9th and 10th century. And the fact that we're finding fragments of these, uh, including in one case, a stack of four bowls with an Abbasid dirham, which had clearly just come off the boat um, from Basra. Basra is the center of production for this type of ceramic, so it must come from um, Basra. The center for the manufacture of such vessels in this period was the port city of Basra in southern Iraq, and it was presumably from there that the vessels were imported confirming archaeologically what's not long been known textually. Fragments of the same ware have been found as far apart as Africa and China, reminding us that when it comes to maritime links, places far distant in space can sometimes be considered as contiguous. The imports of such luxury goods to Western India in the 9th and 10th centuries implies a market for imported manufactured goods among the local elite, a market presumably reciprocated in the export of Indian manufactured goods, such as textiles, and raw materials such as dyes, spices, and tropical hardwoods. The objects, the first objects that I want to discuss come from this broader context, but not from the ports of Western India, but from one of these Arab emirates of Sindh, from the southern city of Mansura, with its port here um, near what today is Karachi of uh, Banbor. The city of Mansura was founded by the Arabs after their arrival in the early 8th century. Among the objects excavated from Mansura were four spectacular cast bronzes, whose importance it would be difficult to underestimate, although they have never appeared or been discussed 
in any survey of Islamic art. These are by far the most spectacular examples of early Islamic metalwork that have survived from anywhere in the Islamic world. There are four monumental door handles from the Dar al-Imara, from the governor's palace of Mansura, the emir's palace of Mansura. They uh, weigh over 70 pounds each. They're about this size, each of them. Technically, technologically, they represent a very major achievement. Um, they fall into anthropomorphic and zoomorphic pairs, as you can see here, with inscriptions that are similar but um, not identical on each. These spectacular objects offer a convenient demonstration of the sorts of information that can be recovered from an extended study of material culture. It's quite interesting because on the basis of these, the differences between the two, they've been split into an Islamic pair and an Indic pair, and it's been suggested that the Islamic pair must be imported from Iraq because they're so fine, they're of such high quality. We have nothing like this um, that survives from Iraq in this period. So one thing that's interesting about this thinking of center and periphery is that the center is being reconstructed from an, as an artistic center from these finds, which are only made in the periphery. Actually, in both quality and scale, there's nothing to compare to these bronzes in the contemporary Islamic world. But the existence of a major metalworking industry in early medieval Sindh is indicated by finds of large-scale Hindu bronzes from the region. This is a spectacular three-foot-high cast bronze statue of Brahma, um, which was recovered from near Mansura in Sindh, one of the most beautiful and one of the most uh, technically sophisticated uh, metal statues to, to have been produced in South Asia in this early period. So it's clear that there's a lot going on in terms of a uh, metalworking tradition in this area in the uh, so-called early Islamic period. In addition, we could point out the fact that the bronze lion faces owe much to contemporary Indic sculptural traditions and local forms, such as the lion faces that we find until today in the fragments of terracotta decoration from the stupas, the Buddhist stupas, that proliferated in this part of the world well into the Arab period, well into the, the 10th century. So that's the roots part of this, that there's a deep local tradition to which these belong. But there's also a route aspect, it's easier to use the American pronunciation to distinguish, <laughs> a route as we're following percentages. Um, there's also a route aspect of these, that if you look carefully, you can, you can, there's all sorts of information you can tease out of these objects. I just want to show you one aspect of them that points to these long distance connections, these routes, as well as these routes. The form and the content of the marginal inscriptions, the Arabic inscriptions that run around the exterior, point, to, indeed point to a relationship with the wider Islamic world. The inscriptions bear the name of the Emir Abdallah ibn Umar, who was the, an Emir of the Habarid uh, dynasty of Arabs that was ruling southern Sindh in the 9th and 10th century. That these guys basically seized power from the Abbasids and had this very complicated relationship with the Abbasids where they uh, enjoyed de facto sovereignty but recognized the de jure authority of the Abbasid uh, caliphate. So it's a very complicated negotiation. So we have on the, the name of the um, Amir Abdallah, and we know because of these travelers' accounts that Abdallah was reigning in Mansoura around 883. So we can actually date these to the second half of the 9th century. Now, this is all the more surprising because the form of the script they use is Precocious. It's not supposed to exist outside the Mediterranean and the Red Sea area um, in this period. And here you see the sorts of things that make art historians very excited. <laughs> the whole thing rests on these little leaves, these little foliations that branch away from the Kufic script, this angular script that's used on the inscriptions on these uh, door handles. The fact that they're produced in Mansura in the 880s is remarkable. Since the Arab legends are the Arabic legends are executed using a foliated variant of the angular Kufic script that became common in the Islamic world only in the 10th century, the precocious use, the fact that the emirs of Mansoura were using this well in advance of, uh, of when they should have, according to <laughs> standard narratives of art history, is confirmed because we have an inscription, a foundation inscription from a mosque built by the uh, emir of Mansoura and dated 904, which makes use of the same kinds of uh, foliations. In other words, these guys are using kinds of scripts that are well 
uh, ahead of their time in terms of where they should be found um, in the second half of the ninth uh, century. Um, we had them much earlier in Egypt and the Hejaz, and remember that Sindh is connected by sea to the Red Sea, to the Hejaz area of Western Arabia, um, and to uh, ultimately to Egypt and the Mediterranean um, beyond. This is an example for comparison of an Egyptian uh, tombstone dated uh, 8, 833, so about 50 years earlier, that also makes use of these foliated scripts. The earliest appearance, of, this early appearance of foliated script in Sindh is undoubtedly related to the circulation of artisans and or artifacts. We don't know well, how they circulate, how these scripts circulate, whether they're copied from objects or whether you actually have artisans in Sindh in this period. But one way or the other, it's related to the circulation of either things or artisans or both in the 9th century by the maritime routes, probably from Egypt, where foliated scripts are employed as early as the 820s. Foliated scripts also make an appearance in the Hejaz, an early appearance in the Hejaz, the site of the holy cities of uh, Mecca and Medina. Their diffusion in South Asia might therefore also reflect the role of pilgrimage in facilitating circulation. Our pilgrimage is actually very important in the circulation of artistic forms across wide distances uh, of this period. Significantly, the only other place outside of the Red Sea and Mediterranean that you find these kinds of foliated Kufic scripts at this period is in Sri Lanka, where a series of Arabic tombstones um, have been recovered from the coastal road that leads to Anuradhapura, the royal city, um, dated from the, uh, the first decade of the ninth century, so several decades um, before this. The Sindhi and Sri Lankan inscriptions represent the sole documented examples of this kind of script outside the Eastern Mediterranean and the, the Red Sea in the ninth century, confirming the role of maritime contacts in the dissemination of contemporary cultural reforms. In fact, the circulation of fancy uh, elaborate scripts between the Red Sea, the Hejaz, and the Indian Ocean has a very long history, and one could actually write a history of uh, inter-Asia based on the circulation of these kinds of fancy scripts. What I want to emphasize is that close attention to the forms and technique of the bronzes recovered from the palace of the Arab rulers of Mansura can provide a range of information that augments and supplements not simply complements the sorts of information that are contained in contemporary texts, whether we're talking about chronicles or geographies. In particular, study of the inscriptions reminds us that the kinds of information that can be gleaned from such pre-modern texts are not confined to the recovery of semantic content, but also relate to material, materiality and medium. The form of the script conveys a message, it tells us that the emirs of Mansura had access to the latest calligraphic styles. This is as important as their content. In short, while the medium may not be the whole message, it's by studying both the content of the inscriptions and their forms that we derive insights into what South Asian is frequently referred to as the complex double movement of South Asian Islam, a dialectic between region and trans-region in which certain communities availed of trans-regional trade networks facilitated on the one hand by the existence of a universal caliphate centered in Baghdad and on the other by the patronage of Muslim traders by regional Indian rulers whose realms lay outside the political orbit of caliph. This dialectic between region and trans-region and the ways in which it complicates notion of center and periphery is no less relevant to my second case study, also taken from a region considered marginal to the, the canonical tellings of arts histories. Um, and again, I leave the question of why Africa until the end. The second example, the second case study, is drawn from a church that stands in a cave in the northern highlands of Ethiopia. So we're talking about somewhat up here. Here, the city of near the town of Lalibela, which was a very major center in Ethiopia in the 12th century, a royal center in Ethiopia in the 12th century. The second example is drawn from a church that stands in a cave nestling below the summit of a mountain in the northern highlands of Ethiopia. What you're looking at here is the mouth of the cave where the church I want to talk about stands, 
uh, and this rather ugly uh, breeze brick wall that's been built across the mouth of the cave to protect the church to, to God. So you're seeing the church peeking out here from, uh, under this uh, very deep cave with this very high, heavy, overhanging rock. It stands in a cave uh, uh, in the northern highlands of Ethiopia, about 12 kilometers from Lalibela. Lalibela famous, of course, for its rock-cut um, churches. So it's, it's in a, a kind of marginal relationship. It's in a rather high, inaccessible place in relation to um, even Lalibela, which is located about 12 kilometers as the crow flies. When they say as the crow flies, you imagine 12 kilometers. In this case, you are uh, traveling between Lalibela and this church. You often wish you were a crow, because it, it takes about five or six very difficult, bumpy hours to get there. Anyway, um, it was also built by the Zagwe dynasty, the people who built the rock-cut, monolithic rock-cut churches in Ethiopia in the 12th century, but it's not excavated from rock. It's actually built using a revived technique, a technique that was 600 years defunct at the point the church was built, using uh, rubble and wood courses plastered over. This is a form of a building technique that was associated with the Aksumite Empire that ruled over Ethiopia, the first Christian empire that ruled over Ethiopia until uh, about the seventh uh, century. So what we have here is a revival of a particularly resonant local style by this dynasty, this Zagwe dynasty that's flourishing in the 12th century and that's building itself up on the international stage uh, partly because of its trading um, connections. So again, this is the, there's a, a, a roots aspect to this. There's an aspect rooted very deeply in the locale of Lalibela, which has to do with the form of the church, the method of construction, and the revival of this. But that's not what I want to talk about. Both the forms and techniques of the building raise a raft of fascinating questions about time and space that directly engage the question not only of geographical, but temporal, imaginaries, both theirs and ours. In doing so, they point to what one might argue is the necessary invocations of geography with history, of space with time, something that came to the fore in the discussion this morning. Now, we have a biography of the builder. The church is known as the Church of Yemrahene Christos. Yemrahene Christos is one of the rulers, the 12th century kings of the Zagwe dynasty that built the church. Um, we have his biography, which is written about two centuries um, later. One of the interesting things about the biography is that it tells us that he sent a messenger to the Sultan of Egypt demanding materials and artisans to decorate his church. Um, and what the biography tells us in particular is that he demanded a wooden door from the palace of the Sultan, the, presumably the Fatimid Sultan of Egypt, to be sent to Ethiopia to decorate the church. Now what's interesting about this emphasis on doors in this narrative that we have that gives us some insight into the context in which this church was built, what's interesting about this is that it's precisely at the door, at the entrance to the church, that we find the, um, the, uh, the, the focus on the door as a sign of the transcultural in the hagiography of the founder is of particular interest since it's in fact the doorway of the church of Yemrahene Christos that provides the clearest evidence for long distance connections, including a carved wooden lintel that appears to have been informed by contemporary Egyptian wood carvers. It's highly likely, in fact, it was carved um, by Egyptian wood carvers. This is what I'm talking about here. This is not the only element of interest, however. In terms of Asia, what's of most interest are the paintings above the entrance of the door. So these here, which are not, so it's a little light here, it's a little different. But these two little paintings here, right above the entrance to the church. Painted on wooden panels above the entrance to the church, likely protecting while also marking it as a royal foundation, are a single image of a lion and a related beast, probably a tiger. Although these paintings have failed to attract much attention, they are vital evidence is there any way that the lights could be dimmed slightly here so that the, the slides could actually be uh, more visible? Just even the front row here. Um, and is there a way I could have the lights? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Although these paintings have failed to attract much attention, they're vital evidence 
for the participation of the Zagways, that's the local ruling dynasty, in the 12th century world system. A search for suitable comparanda highlights a very close relationship between the painted figures um, and the figure of a lion found on the gold coinage issued by the Kadamba dynasty that ruled over western, the western coast of India in the 11th and 12th century. That's exactly the moment when it's been suggested that the, our royal chapel, our Ethiopian chapel was being constructed. And these are examples of Kadamba coinage, coinage struck in the 11th and 12th century on the west coast of India, around the area of what today is Goa, which is the main center of Kadamba rule, um, which travels with this image of a lion in various forms on it. Particularly characteristic in this respect is the treatment of the lion's tail. If you notice this, this curious double loop with the circle on it here, which is not a normal feature. It's very peculiar um, to Kadamba coin uh, imagery, the imagery that circulates on Kadamba coinage. And just to remind you, we're talking about the West Coast of India's Goa here, separated by the, um, the Indian Ocean, and then our church is up here in the, in the north. This feature, this feature of a double loop with a dot, recurs on our paintings and offers very strong uh, evidence for a relationship to uh, the, the image of the line that circulated on Kadamba coinage. It's unclear whether the paintings are Indian imports or executed locally following Indian models. Both are possible. I actually think they're Indian imports. If that's the case, these would be the only examples of Kadamba painting known. Only examples of Kadamba painting known, even in South Asia. We don't have paintings like this that survive in Goa anymore. They would be preserved in this small church in a cave um, in northern uh, Ethiopia, which is interesting to think about in terms of center and uh, periphery. Further fragmentary evidence for these kinds of exchange comes from excavations at the site of Shanga, here on the coast of East Africa, in these Arab emporia on the coast of East Africa, a Muslim trading emporium on the coast of, of Kenya, which have produced solid evidence for the circulation of Indian artifacts within the Indian Ocean trading networks, including a bronze lion statuette that stands 61 millimeters high, six centimeters high, and that analysis, metallurgical analysis, has suggested was cast from the metal of Chinese coins. Now, this is a kind of bronze lion statuette which is very familiar from southern India. Stylistically, it belongs to southern India. It's not clear whether it was made in southern India or whether it was made on the coast of East Africa, but it's almost certain that it was made, the metal was in part taken from recast Chinese coins. The archaeological context indicates that the statuette was deposited or disposed of shortly before 1100 of the Common Era. The closest comparanda for this lion figure, the Shanga lions, come from a series of South Indian bronzes of the 11th through 13th centuries. And these offer further um, indications of a relationship, an Indian relationship for our uh, painted lion. Notice, for example, the treatment of the collar here, this low-hanging, very stylized collar, which is exactly what you get on these lion um, statuettes. Comparison of the door paintings of the church of Yemrani Christos with Kadamba coinage and South Indian uh, lion statuettes thus provides concrete evidence for what has long been suspected, that medieval Ethiopian elites participated in a world of visual forms and practices that not, not only extended north towards the Mediterranean through Egypt, but also eastwards across the thousands of miles of ocean separating the central highlands of Ethiopia from the west coast of India. Like the Arab emirs of Sindh in the 9th and 10th centuries, the Zagwe kings of Lalibela exploited their key positions at the intersection of north-south and east-west circuits of exchange in order to maximize the conspicuous consumption of imported cultural forms in the articulation of visually cosmopolitan identities. The presence of these paintings, most likely directly imported from 12th century Goa, provides graphic evidence of Ethiopia's role as an integral part of a circuit within what, following Janet Abu Gogod, one might term the 12th century world system, a circuit of artistic exchange that in this case included the northern Mediterranean, central Indio uh, Ethiopia, and the Indian Ocean in its purview. And what the point I'm making implicitly, I should make explicit here, is that it's often thought, and, and uh, Janet Abu-Logod in, in a way contributes to this, 
that the world system, so-called, pops into being with the Mongol conquest. But I think what you're looking at is a kind of a layering that you, the, the Mongols are already building on these long-distance uh, trade networks that are already in place by about 1200. However, the case studies that I've presented here also suggest that attempts to address the presentism of contemporary discourses on globalization by invoking or identifying an er moment of pre-modern globalization, where we global in uh, the Yuan period, where we global in the 12th century, where we, that these attempts are likely to be perpetually confounded by the surprising mobility of specific kinds of things and persons. While the Ethiopian material provides insights into a particular moment in the trans-regional circulations, integral to the self-fashioning of many pre-modern elites, the role of sin as a key nexus in circuits of exchange involving the Indian Ocean two or three centuries earlier reminds us of the need to consider the scale and impact of such circuits across the long durée in relation to shifting constellations of political and other kinds of power and the cultural, economic, and political systems that they enabled, exploited, and underwrote. We could and should include our own power to represent past, present, and the relations between them within such shifting constellations of power. In conceiving, for example, uh, Asia as an interconnected region of circulations, exchange, and flows, inter-Asia also inevitably brings into sharper focus the question of limits, whether historical, modern, are entirely arbitrary. As we strive to negotiate the terrain between dystopian, uh, dystopian localisms and utopian universalisms, or vice versa, it is, I think, also important to bear in mind the risks of producing new frontiers, or even reinscribing those long central to European colonial discourses, within which not all others were equal in their otherness. I'm thinking, of course, of Africa and its long historical connectedness to Asia, not only through Arabia and the Gulf, but also, as we've seen, more directly across the Indian Ocean, as one of the many circuits of exchange that made up the pre-modern world system, wherever you want to locate its chronological limits. What we can learn from the past, I suggest, is that the real challenge in thinking through inter-Asia is to leave the limits of Asia sufficiently ragged, or if you like, more eloquently, sufficiently rhizomatic, um, that they adjoin, connect, and intersect, rather than close, delineate, or terminate. Thank you. Thank you very much for very stimulating and also exciting uh, agenda, inter-Asian connections. Um, I, I, I myself uh, have been uh, working or struggling on these issues uh, by bringing back many issues which has been recognized as uh, East-West paradigm into inter-Asia or intra-Asia uh, connections or relations. And, uh, in, in, in these two decades, I have been working on uh, Ryukyu history. Uh, uh, this is a very continual uh, written document, first of all, 
and uh, it continues more than 440 years consistently. And also, uh, this uh, material uh, includes very strong Hokkien merchant migration network uh, through northern Kyushu to Ryukyu and then Taiwan to Southeast Asia. And also this migration network is very strong trade network which Ryukyu Kingdom were relied on these Hokkien merchant network. And also from east-west comparisons point of view, in this period we really uh, usually relied on East India Company record to discuss Asia and West. And uh, Ryukyu Kingdom record of Didai Pawan uh, starting from 1424 or ending 1867 is much earlier compared to East India Company's record and also much longer uh, including uh, varieties, uh, some uh, local information and also this uh, record of tributary mission to, to China and Southeast Asia and also other East Asia includes some epidemic record uh, in their way to preaching, uh, some uh, passed away uh, by epidemic or by accident. Uh, these records are very uh, clearly uh, uh, read uh, and also quite interesting. Uh, according to the different situation, uh, their burial manner is also different. And also this uh, record includes some Hokkien dialect because this is written, uh, handwritten record by Hokkien uh, merchant in Ryukyu. So uh, officially this is a Ryukyu Kingdom tributary trade record but uh, they also include some social, cultural and also uh, migration or uh, linguistic related agenda. So uh, from 1990, uh, Okinawa Prefecture started to recompile this uh, record. I, I joined from the start and then uh, at the time I'm among the youngest among editors, but now I became one of the <laughs> old group. So it's still we are struggling. Uh, now two, two thirds of, of this record were compiled and edited and we are planning to translate this record into English uh, with digitalized version and try to provide a much wider uh, discussion and analysis. And today also I try to explain uh, this UQ trade networks among tributary countries, not just tributary trade with China, but UQ in order to uh, get tributary commodity, they send missions uh, to Southeast Asia and other East Asian countries. Uh, then uh, UQ network varies according to their uh, purposes and also uh, surrounding conditions. And this is a uh, UQ trade network. Ryukyu is a small island in between Kyushu and Taiwan. 
and uh, Ryukyu sent very uh, long distance trading mission all the way to Southeast Asia to get pepper and sabal. And after Chen Chen Kong closed this Taiwan channel, Ryukyu shift their main trading uh, relation between China and Japan. And then in order to get silver, Ryukyu merchant uh, visited Manila <coughs> to get silver and then invested to China-Japan trade. So according to different stages, uh, early period, in, during Ming period, uh, 14 to 16th century, Ryukyu trade to Southeast Asia to get pepper and sabang. And after uh, 17th century, uh, Ryukyu entered uh, China-Japan trade more closely. And also Ryukyu traded with Korea from very early period. And thinking about the history of Korea, the Korean king need to tribute the Southeast Asia product, <coughs> pepper and sapangut, from very early period. And the Korean king always blamed uh, we don't have this kind of commodity, so we need to stop to tribute this pepper and sapangut. So early Ming or uh, after uh, all calls period, Ryukyu uh, was established in between Korea and Southeast Asia. So Ryukyu factors are closely related with Korean king, kingdom and also closely related to Southeast Asia, particularly Siam, Thai rice has been imported into Ryukyu even now to get their uh, spirits. And uh, during the closing policy of rice importation of Japanese government, only Okinawa was allowed to import rice from Siam, Thai, Thailand, to get uh, this kind of spirit. So uh, the location of Ryukyu, or uh, nowadays Okinawa, is on the way of uh, Southeast Asia and East Asia, a very uh, wide range of uh, trading network. And also uh, through Philippines, connecting uh, East, Southeast Pacific to the United States. So to think about the whole history of Ryukyu, the current Okinawa, including military base, uh, very much geopolitical importance from both regions. So uh, Ryukyu issues is not just uh, one island or island's issue, but also a uh, sort of uh, confrontation between different regions, including maritime regions. Uh, thinking about the tributary commodities, uh, these are listed under tributary commodities, horse, sulfur, salt, ivory, incense, globe, sapound and pepper. And sapound and pepper is the largest commodity. And sulfur is uh, only their own product nearby for the stuff of gunpowder. And the horse is very symbolic uh, uh, tributary commodities. And also horse network starting Middle East, uh, extending to Indonesia and uh, moving to Ryukyu is also uh, very interesting. And from Min Dynasty, uh, Min Emperor's point of view, in order to, to cope with modern uh, 
minorities. Uh, they, they needed horse, horses. And then also Korean king always blamed we can't uh, grow uh, horses, so it is impossible. So uh, compared to the required number, uh, the numbers of horses from Korean king are rather small. And Ryukyu itself, nowadays they say this is Ryukyu horse, but I, I'm sure Ryukyu originally cows based uh, cultivation. So they imported and grow uh, horses. And this is a sort of uh, tributary, and this is a part of list of, of long, long statistics. And at the same time, we can see uh, UQ King Trail. This is a sort of uh, tributary part, uh, expressed tributary part uh, more clearly. And it's about uh, every year three to six tons. And pepper, 0.6 to one ton per year. So it's a uh, quite huge amount of uh, uh, commodities. And uh, according to uh, uh, British consulate at Fuzhou, Fuzhou is a uh, tributary port where Ryukyu needed to enter. Uh, in 1851, uh, British consulate at Fuzhou, Sinclair reported when uh, Ryukyu Junk uh, for tribute commodities uh, entered to Fuzhou. Uh, he, he, he reported a list of the tribute and presents together with that of the imported and armament of the two vessels is in for the inspection of the authorities. Their approval being obtained, the tribute bearers starts under escort with the tribute to Peking. Whilst authority is issued for the breaking of bulk, a list of the imports being furnished the brokers for the purpose of ascertaining the rates they can obtain for the cargo compatible with the profit to themselves for their labor. They then tender in to the new two traders according to the portion each undertakes to dispose of the several rates which they have they were prepared to give or if exports the prices they have fixed upon to charge the species which the Ryuchu traders import to cover the purchase of return cargo consists of small Japanese gold coin containing much alloy and in the form of thin square leaves of a copper color. It being very light and portable, it is when not converted into Sai C silver for payments at that port carried by the brokers to Canton and Suzhou to be sold there. So here we find the Canton and Suzhou uh, not just tributary route to get other commodities for import they send brokers from Fuzhou to Canton and Suzhou. Uh, even these tributary commodities uh, through uh, market uh, transaction, we can find they, they, they try to negotiate to sell or to buy uh, their imports. And relating to Canton and Suzhou, 
the purchase of goods for Liu Chu necessitating the visit of brokers to Canton and Suzhou, and the moderate charge of transport of merchandise must in measure account for a large portion of the European manufacturers having been laid in at other markets than Fuzhou, where I assume, presume the brokers could supply themselves more readily than here and probably at cheaper rates. It appears on this occasion that the brokers deputed to these places have taken, respectively, Amoy and Shanghai in their way and have collected their stock of goods in proportion as the different between difference between the market price of each place and the rates agreed to by the Ryuchu traders turned to their own profit. So uh, it's 1851 and uh, we uh, on the one hand uh, try to uh, investigate what is tributary trade, contents of tributary trade such as this kind of uh, uh statistics. But at the same time, uh, how about the end of tribute? And last stage of tributary trade, uh, according to British consulate at Fuzhou report, we can find Ryukyu traders after entering Fuzhou as a tributary mission, they send brokers at Fuzhou to southward to Canton and also northern ward to Suzhou to Canton to get British cotton textile mostly and to Suzhou silk uh, weavings. So uh, this is uh, classified as international trade so besides tributary trade, traditional tributary trade, we can find Ryukyu also involved a sort of international trade to get British cotton textile, not directly, but from Kwantung market. And also they send brokers to Suzhou to get silk. So this is really, uh, though tributary trade rather rigidly understood as a, a sort of present uh, transaction, but actually it's really international market and also domestic market related. And uh, different merchant group joined to sell and buy these commodities for UQ uh, mission. Of course, after uh, UQ was taken over, Japanese Meiji government, in 1868, this trade channel was changed and also uh, Ryukyu was closed. Uh, their international trade was closed. So it doesn't continue much longer, but we can find within tributary trade, internal uh, market trade, and also international market trade through Kwantung or Shanghai uh, already started after 1840s. And uh, returning back the Ryukyu tributary trade, uh, we can find uh, a, a sort of uh, geocultural or geopolitical model of uh, tributary system. Uh, I am typed as a system, uh, if we, we can say, uh, with uh, emperor at the center and uh, surrounding uh, concentric circle uh, uh, type of influence from the center toward outside. And then uh, this uh, periphery area is formed of uh, tributary uh, countries. And uh, by this surroundings or periphery uh, Ryukyu uh, mission traded 
So compared to their uh, trade uh, channel, we can find the periphery uh, along with uh, tributary countries, uh, Ryukyu traded uh, for their tributary commodities. So uh, thinking about the, their trading network, this is formed by a sort of regional uh, integration or e regional uh, sort of a principle to, to form of this region under uh, tributary relations. So this tributary and also migration channel uh, overlapping this uh, tributary relations. And thinking about uh, tributary relations, uh, usually it is discussed from the center. And of course, uh, particularly Ming Qin dynasty uh, stipulate tributary relation very, very detailed uh, stipulation. And uh, we also need to understand tributary relation from the center, but at the same time, and particularly in my case, I try to trace the tributary relation from the periphery, and also from the maritime sea. And more and more, I tend to understand tributary relation through the function of maritime sea, controlling maritime sea, protecting or pushing the maritime sea trade, and also uh, controlling or taxing uh, commodities through uh, coastal ports. So thinking about maritime sea, uh, we can also find some maritime region, not just extension of the land uh, or territorial land. Uh, thinking about uh, East China Sea and South China Sea and Bengal Bay is a continuum connecting each other. And we can find, besides coastal trade, the cross-sea trade, like uh, Nagasaki and Ningpo merchant, with copper trade during the Edo period, is much closer than their inland market trade. So cross-sea is one of the principle forming uh, maritime sea as a unit of activities or uh, zones of, of the migration, trade, and even cultural intercourse. And then South China Sea, we can see uh, many different uh, port cities and also uh, amongst, within South China Sea, we can find Java Sea, or uh, extension to uh, Philippines uh, like Coral Sea, Tasman Sea, until Tasman Sea of Australia. Uh, like this, the chain of seas we can find in uh, between continent and peninsula and the islands of, of Asia. So we can discuss Asia more uh, full, full meaning through uh, chain of seas, particularly the uh, connecting seas, the main port connecting seas, such as uh, Canton and uh, Malacca. Uh, later on, uh, Hong Kong played uh, the similar uh, role, or uh, Hong Kong absorbed the uh, historical resources of trading port from Canton, and also Singapore uh, absorbed uh, historical resources of trading facilities and so on from Malacca. So this Hong Kong and uh, Singapore is uh, not just uh, a sort of uh, uh, colonial context, much earlier these two uh, locations 
is a sort of connecting seas uh, location and uh, very close to Malacca and very close to Canton. So the function is connecting seas. So actually, uh, the tributary trade based on maritime trade are moving after mid-19th century toward maritime custom uh, relations. And for example, Korea started to set up maritime custom through Chinese maritime customs to increase the, the finance of government and send missions to Japan three times and negotiated rather high ratio of tax. And major government tried to lower the tax. So major government rejected the proposal by Korean government. But in the case of China, uh, foreign inspectorate of maritime customs uh, organized the coastal trade and also uh, Korean maritime customs. So uh, among tributary relations, uh, which is formed of formed of uh, three dimension uh, cultural uh, geocultural issues and uh, economic issues and uh, and other like uh, political or military issues. Uh, particularly on economic issues, I, I can argue from tribute to maritime customs. And as a, as a conclusion, uh, what kind of related agenda or uh, uh, perspectives, periphery and or frontier studies in regional connections is more uh, clear to understand the role of Ryukyu and also from periphery studies through Ryukyu trade. Uh, we can uh, find out more uh, whole, whole total image of uh, Ryukyu uh, tributary relations. Also, the relationship between China and Ryukyu. And then uh, intra-Asian connections. Uh, something like pepper, silver, uh, those things are mostly uh, studied through East India Company record in the, the relationship between East and West. But thinking about UQ trade network, the pepper, silver is also very important to Eastward, not Westward only. Then the third issue, dynamism of local region in global history studies. Uh, world history and global history, uh, which is which this argument, I, I didn't talk much today, but uh, thinking about the dynamism of local region also raised their hands to join the global history, which means global history uh, changed the previous, the layers of idea of regions from world to local. Then maritime history studies also reflect the inter-Asian or intra-Asian issues. And we need to develop uh, these four agendas so far uh, more uh, deeply. And UQ material is one of them to consult. Thank you very much. Um, thank you everyone for being here and for bringing us here, the organizers. Um, this is the third of our inter-Asia meetings and on this occasion I've been uh, giving some thought to where these efforts fit in the larger world and what directions they may be pointing in within our smaller world of scholarship. 
Though the sentiment may not be shared by all, I think one could say that a measure of anti-imperial and anti-Western sentiment, or let's say anti-Western bullying sentiment, drives some of our efforts. Colonialism has of course been a major topic of study across the humanities and social sciences for the past few decades, uh, but one whose importance seemed to be receding with the advent of something called globalization and the new century, falling more and more into the preserve of the historian. For how long can the Indians keep blaming the English for their problems after all? <laughs> At the same time, however, even as the European powers foreswore colonialism, a new military adventurousness abroad began after the fall of the Soviet Union, with the 1990s wars in Bosnia, went into full force in Afghanistan and Iraq after 2001, and seemed quite practicable in the toppling of Gaddafi in Libya recently, at the hands of second-rate European powers borrowing bullets from the Americans. Today, we still don't quite know what to make of the long arm of America's lawlessness, her new prerogative in shooting them up preemptively with drones wherever they may be, in Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia, and God knows where. In the meantime, China, East Asia, Southeast Asia kept their noses close to the factory grindstone, peacefully churning out masses of goods at a prodigious pace, growing 10% per year for decades. The rise of China and its relentless integration with other parts of Asia, creating an industrial commons open to, all, to orders from all humanity, for all manner of goods at the right price, at a low price even, without the need for colonial takeover, seemed to present a new model for an international trading world. A model which European Enlightenment thinkers such as Adam Smith and Montesquieu had waxed eloquent about, in which nations trading with one another would not fight each other. Sweet commerce, Montesquieu had called it. Europe, since it began to stand astride the world in the 16th century, had never, never lived up to Montesquieu's promise. Europe always mixed trade with raid, war with economy. In the Americas and the West Indies, it had been colonial monopoly and conquest, while in the East Indies, the shibboleth became free trade and excess, doors open with gunboats if need be, the story of Hong Kong's birth. In 1998, André Gunder Frank cheerfully reminded us that all this was only a bad dream, a mere 500-year blip in a longer history in which China was the center of the world economy and was about to regain its historical position. Europe, which produced nothing the Asians wanted, had dug silver out of the Americas by force and with it gained entry into a world, uh, world economy dominated by China. If this was true, could it be that there might exist an alternative to the European model of twinning trade with raid as a way of running global economy and keeping order? André Gunder Frank sought to reorient the title of his book to reorient our vision towards what he saw as a renewed Asian age in the making. Well, his timing was impeccable. This was 1998, okay? This was the year the Asian financial crisis got into full swing. Western speculators had driven down the value of Southeast Asian currencies. These countries, now unable to repay now expensive short-term US dollar loans, stood to have their prime assets bought, bought up by Western vultures for a song if they agreed to IMF conditions for a bailout. Caught between Western speculators and Western vultures, they were thrown a lifeline by Japan and Taiwan, who offered bailout, bailout funds on easy terms to tide them through a rough patch without having to sell the farm. To have such an offer come from East Asia was historic. Never happened before. It was a gesture that acknowledged a longer-term shared interest, and the sort of long-term Professor uh, Hamashita has uh, given us such a wonderful view of, um, a long-term shared interest and an unwillingness to profit from the troubles of neighbors for short-term gain. Did Indonesia, Thailand take up the offer? No. Why not? Larry Summers, the US Treasury Secretary, stepped in and essentially shooed off the Japanese and the Taiwanese, telling them to buzz off, insisting that the Southeast Asians look west to the IMF instead. There is no zero 
economic logic to this demand, only a political one, a purely political one. The moment is captured in this picture, and I have only one slide, unlike my well, colleagues. Um, <laughs> the moment is captured in this uh, picture from January 1998. Um, with the French IMF head Michel Cambissou arms folded impassively, waiting for President Suharto to sign on the dotted line. In a matter of months, Suharto was history. Across the Strait of Malacca, Suharto's counterpart, Dr. Mahathir Mohamed of Malaysia, was more bold. Mahathir closed his country's financial borders, made his currency non-convertible, thereby locking in foreign investors, and kicked out his finance minister, who by going to the IMF essentially wanted Mahathir to share Suharto's fate. This was not the first time Mahathir had turned his back on the West, both its politics and its commerce. In the early 1980s, Mahathir had initiated a Look East campaign. Looking East then meant looking to Japan, not China. It did not even mean economics. The key moment for Mahathir was Japan's military defeat of Russia at the turn of the century. If successfully mix mixing economics and politics meant acquiring industrial power, then the Japanese were the first Asians to have done it. And to do it, other Asians needed to look to Japan, not the West. Just in case that very subtle point was lost, Mahathir initiated another campaign which he called Buy British Last, just in case you didn't get the point. <laughs> Over the next few decades, a number of countries followed Malaysia's example. Singapore began looking east to China in the 1980s and 90s. India began looking east, not to China, but to Southeast Asia in 1993. Zimbabwe and Iran started look east campaigns when they had problems with the West in 2003 or 4. Turkey began looking east to the Arab world and South and East Asia during the tenure of the current foreign minister, Ahmad Davutulu. Arabia and Persian Gulf states have also done so to Singapore and China, beginning with King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia's visits to China, India, Pakistan and Malaysia, rather than Washington on his 2006 inaugural trips abroad. Even the US is now looking east with Obama's announcement of his pivot from the Middle East to Pacific Asia, promising to send the majority of his warships in that direction. Maybe not a good idea. The crescendo of these Look East policies may be seen as a strengthening of what is called South-South relations in the UN speak of Willy Brandt. We could also call them East-East or Inter-Asian relations. And though South-South, East-East, inter-Asian relations may be thought of as a return to historical norm, where neighbors have thicker relations with each other rather than going in parallel westwards to the capitals of different and distant colonial masters. Looking at East Asia, uh, those relations have thickened in the past two decades with trade, investment, and travel, despite, despite the continuing presence of an American line all the way down the East China coast, keeping Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, and the Philippines on the opposite side of China in security terms. The map uh, Professor Hamashita gave us with Ryukyu as a central point. Now, in all this activity, it is we scholars who have been caught flat-footed. The material reality of these burgeoning relations across Asia has inspired us to study them. This is a pretty straightforward agenda item for our inter-Asian gathering. And at this moment, it is not so much anti-imperialism as simple, pure and simple awe and amazement that are driving us to explore new kinds of scholarship. It is also driving us to look at the past again, to see if there were external relations present that we somehow did not see because we were not ready to recognize them. Why were we not ready to recognize them? It is not simply that the nation state somehow put blinders uh, on us, and that we somehow then came to, to take off those blinders when something called globalization came along. I want to suggest to you today that the problem is deeper than that. The problem is that to varying degrees of self-consciousness, we work in an enlightenment tradition of Western social theory that has been obsessed with an internalist and constitutionalist view of society, of what society is. 
that tradition very early on sought to avoid or to expunge the external from theory in order to create a society for a state and vice versa. Think of your classic triumvirate in your social theory classes, Marx, Weber, and Durkheim. For Marx, the structure of society was defined by relations between classes. For Weber, it was status, status groups. And for Durkheim, it was mechanical or organic solidarity. More recently, post-war, post-war American social scientists came to see societies as being composed of fissiparous ethnic groups within a single plural society. Foucault's microphysics of power mobilized an undisciplined population for a national state. Habermas's public sphere subsisted on national languages separately for the English, the French, and the Germans, and so on. These constitutional ideas are, in turn, often inseparable from normative claims. The theorizing of democratic rule in the universities in the West creates measuring sticks by which Western powers gauge the degree to which other states are adequate or inadequate, legitimate or illegitimate in the way they internally constitute their societies. In the extreme, non-democratic regimes may be overthrown by Western powers in the name of their own oppressed people. The internal constitutional work of social theory and the liberal impulse that motivates a lot of that work can shade quite quickly into aggressive, expansive foreign action. Now, abolition is a preeminent example of this uncanny collusion between liberal theory and imperial expansion. Once a metropolitan consensus had been achieved on slavery by 1833, a 180-degree turn against what they themselves had done in the West Indies, the English state was only too happy to now wield anti-slavery as a cudgel with which to do regime change in the East Indies in the 19th century. Slavery was held up as a key test for the internal constitution of native states, whether they practice the ultimate gross inequality, to see if they should be dissolved or allowed to remain. Widow burning, the Muslim veil, and other tests were to follow suit. Lest we see all this only in cynical terms, let me suggest a way in which abolition was not only an excuse for regime change. Rather, abolition was part of a wholesale re-envisioning of how a state and a society could be reconfigured on moral grounds and made fitter for the creation of both wealth and war-making capacity. That reconfiguration also created the substantive theoretical frame for a powerful internal constitutionalist sociology that kept us thinking along national lines and banishing the external. This theoretical frame was created by Adam Smith, as an alternative to the mercantilist system that kept America colonized in thrall of the English. Colonialism was an um, international economy in which capital from England, slave labor from Africa, were combined with land in America to produce wealth. So this was an international economy. Because it was monopolistic, this international economy had to be kept together by violent force. The Navy, plantation supervisors with whips, and so on. Now, Adam Smith's solution to this violent, immoral, and international economy of slavery, um, of slavery, colonialism, and monopoly, was to shrink it to England's own borders, to repatriate all the factors of production. Smith argued that English, capi English capital, employing English labor on English land, if organized efficiently, uh, competitively, could produce more wealth than all the plantations of America. A world-beating English workshop could export enough goods to accumulate the gold needed to fight foreign wars, even without slaves or colonies. These three factors of production, land, labor, and capital, now repatriated to England, would then give rise to the three great classes of society, landlords, workers, and capitalists. In Smith's theoretical architecture is found a whole economics and a whole sociology which were to keep social theorists busy for the next few centuries. What is relevant to us here is that they would be kept busy within the box of a national state that could contain a whole world-beating economy, class structure, and moral organization of society. 
Adam Smith essentially gave us a powerful argument for forgetting about the external, the international, the transvisional, and in a state, instead for staying home and perfecting the national industrial workshop to the world. Strange as it sounds, this English workshop model was the development model the post-colonial world grew up on, trumpeted by both national elites and uh, international institutions. Now this capsule sketch of the historical conditions of production of social theory, I hope, gives some sense of what we have been up against intellectually in attempting to set our sights outside of the nation state to do all the border crossing, globalizing, transnational imperial investigations that are all the rage today. This review is of use, I think, because it says, if we go beyond the nation state, we are willy-nilly giving up the sort of integrated vision of economy, society, and morality that comes packaged with it. Another way to put it is this. Culture is like butter. The more you spread it around, the thinner it gets. In other words, the issue we face is how do we do transnational work that is thick? Thick transnationalism, I suggest, is a major desideratum to keep in mind and to aim for as we look beyond the nation. What is at stake here is whether we can come up with concepts and methods that formulate substantive notions of economy, society, culture, and politics as we move away from internal constitutionalist frames to externalist ones. Are we moving in the right directions? How far have we come? Now, having participated in three of our inter-Asia meetings over the past six years now, it seems to me that Asia provides a very fruitful empirical basis for developing this sort of work. Asia is a large and old world whose terrain and bodies of water have been crisscrossed by peoples over millennia. Asia currently has a nation state we love to hate, but it also has the old empires, religious movements, diasporas, trade exchanges, artistic creations and relocations that come and go across its surface over centuries. If we think of inter-Asia as minimally pointing to relations across different parts of the space, then we see that a wealth of possibilities opens up before our eyes. This has been my experience reading papers and applications, listening to talks at our meetings, and especially uh, this panel today. Time is short, so let me conclude by running through a list of concepts and methods that I think can add up to a substantive and thick transnationalism. First, I had six points, but uh, after listening to, uh, the two, my two previous presenters, I would add a zero point, which is that inter-Asia uh, is very useful because in it, as we have seen uh, this afternoon, we have an unusually strong, basically non-Western data set, whether textual or material. <coughs> And um, this point has been made beautifully this afternoon by Barry Flood and Takeshi Hamashita. To go on to the uh, conceptual and methodological points, number one, uh, mobility. Mobility is an, uh, an unusually large number of papers follow things that move. Mobility as method has brought into analysis whole categories of empirical phenomena which fell out of view before. This is probably the single most significant and dramatic development I have seen. Mobility is nerve-wracking because you don't know where it is going to lead. And most dissertation supervisors get very nervous thinking they'll end up with doctoral students off on a wild goose chase and not graduating after 15 years on the road. So that's a certain challenge to mobility. Number two, connective studies. A method a lot connective studies a methodological focus on mobility leads to studies which tend to be connective rather than comparative. Connective studies bring more data and variables to the table and can lead in surprising directions towards surprising unexpected connections as we saw in uh, Barry Flood's uh, presentation or towards more comprehensive formulations of problems and solutions as we saw in Takeshi Hamashita's uh, presentation. The third uh, uh, thing I want to mention is scale. Transregional scale and intermediate scale. Scholars working on inter-Asian connections are spared the vaunting ambition of going global on the one hand and being trapped by the local on the other. 
In following people's movements, goods, and other things, scholars often draw links between adjacent regions and come up with studies we call trans-regional. And this has come up again uh, in this panel. The trans-regional is an intermediate level, not local and not global. It seems to me that phenomena at this level often get lost in the localist studies contained by methodological nationalism. They also disappear in the abstractions of globalization. It is research on this intermediate scale that has given us much of the most exciting results we have seen over the past six years in uh, the inter-Asia conferences, I think. The fourth thing is partial societies. When we work on a transregional or intermediate scale, we are in each location working with location working with partial notions of society rather than total or fragmentary ones. The incompleteness of each part makes us seek the ways in which it engages or is entangled with other parts at a distance. The first thing is a uh, fifth thing is circulation. Circulation. Travel takes time. Long distance travel takes even more time. When there is time, things become possible that would otherwise not be possible. With time, good things can be repeated. Good traits and relations can be maintained. Repetition creates stability, substance, habit, custom, reality. Repetition over both dimensions of space and time creates what we call circulation. Circulation gives a substantive sociological al alternative to notions of structure. Structure which connotes fixity and perdurance through time, or without the basic elements moving. This is the problem with structure. Indeed, the Enlightenment social theorists replace the vertical hierarchies of divine rule with the horizontal patterns of circulation to create concepts of society that were flat and egalitarian, yet natural and necessary in their own right. Social circulations were like the circulation of blood, which was essentially and undeniably part of the force of life. Nature, rather than divinity, now provided the analogical conceptual grounding for this new thing called society, which they discovered uh, in the Enlightenment. The last thing I will mention is what you might call outside-in. Combining these dimensions of research and analysis allows us to return to receive, receive containers or social units, and to rework them from the outside in, as it were. Properly done, an outside in approach helps us capture the many dimensions we need to understand, for example, how figures like the Cantonese Sun Yat Sen and the Gujarati Mohandas Gandhi were able to harness the mental, material, and social energies needed to overthrow the long-established Qing and British empires from their countries and to introduce new concepts into society. What I'm saying here is that using this sort of uh, analysis, uh, one can think of Sun Yat-sen and uh, Gandhi as persons who are part of diasporic groups, diasporic groups which are mercantile, which come from major world-class production and export centers, such as Gujarat and the Pearl River Delta Coast, uh, persons who in modern days are professionally educated, who have familiarity with the West. And I submit to you that it is with these sorts of conceptual approaches that we can really uh, start to understand how it is that uh, figures like Gandhi and Sun Yat-sen were able to come up. And so in the end, uh, looking at Sun Yat-sen and Gandhi, through these connective uh, lenses, ultimately enables us to do very large comparative uh, um, analyses as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll ask all three of the speakers to come up on stage now so we can face some questions. Uh, we do have about 20 minutes or so for questions. I'm sure there will be many more uh, that we'll have to continue over the tea break. But I do ask this for everyone who does ask a question to try to keep it as short as possible so we can get as many of them in, uh, in the time that we have here. Um, and we'll look at the floor. Can I didn't mean to intimidate questions, I just asked them.
Um, this is more of a comment rather than a question uh, in St. Ho. I enjoyed your work as usual. Uh, I think though you, in your polemic, it worked very well to stress Asia and uh, uh, you know, the West in your discussion of the uh, financial crisis, the wonderful photograph of Ka Kamadesu and Suharto. But uh, remember that uh, China also sabotaged, torpedoed the, uh, the Japanese Taiwanese attempt to set up uh, an Asian monetary fund. This is small uh, footnote here. Um, yeah, I'm not so familiar with the uh, ins and outs of the Asian monetary fund. Central banking move, but I, uh, I actually don't know exactly what, what uh, China China was doing. Well, they were trying to carry. It, it may have made China nervous that this might have been a sub-American play. For example, I don't know. Any other questions, comments? Yes, in the back. Oh, it's here. Uh, I also have a question to ask Senko. While I found myself um, agreeing with, with many of your conclusions in the course for what type of analysis might help um, yeah, the future of humanities and social sciences um, in the Asian context, I wondered, uh, I understood there to be an implicit critique of constitutionalism, and I think that many of the phenomena that we work on actually rely on some sort of rule of law after all the maritime networks only really function if there's predictability of law. I'm not talking about the rule of law context of a modern democracy, but some sort of predictability of what the rules of the game are that make uh, inter-trade networks possible in the first place. And so I wasn't quite sure what this critique of constitutionalism uh, aimed at. Yeah, um, is this on? Okay, yes. Um, it was, uh, if you remember what I said, a critique of constitutionalism or constitutionalist theory not just of constitutionalist theory, but of internalist constitutionalist theory. And the internalist point is very important because the sorts of uh, trade relations and guarantees you are talking about, essentially I take to be externalist. Okay? And if you look at uh, histories of constitutionalism, you see that, I don't know, apparently the very earliest ones are not internalist, but actually externalist. So in, in, in Athens, uh, you have a constitution uh, which guarantees the rights of foreign merchants in Athens, beginning of constitutional democracy and so on. The first thing that is guaranteed is actually not the rights of internal citizens, but external merchants. If you go to uh, Sri Lanka, Colombo Gaul, I think in the Colombo Museum, there's a stone, it's called the Gaul Stone, with, um, with inscriptions in three languages. I believe it was uh, put up by Cheng Po. And the languages, if I'm not mistaken, are, um, I can't remember now, Chinese, Tamil, and uh, Arabic or Persian, I can't remember. But these are three languages, the three languages of the external merchants, essentially saying that if you come here, we guarantee you rule of law, we guarantee a system of weights and measures, exchange rate, currency, and so on. And similarly, with the, uh, the codes of the molecular law codes, uh, which has been published uh, from Shafi'i law, it also does something very similar. It, it, it guarantees the rights of foreign merchants. So I think there is a constitutionalism, you're right, there is a constitutionalism uh, one can think of, but it, is, it can be externalist rather than internalist. And there are a number of these examples. Okay. I think your, your examples were very different from the usual ones that uh, we can see in the literature about um, the traveling or circuits of objects, so um, I appreciated that. Um, uh, but often these um, narratives seem to focus on um, the political or imperial powers and then on merchants and you know, the ways in which the objects travel from place to place. And I was just wondering, it's just a question whether um, there are any studies or whether we are able for those periods to study the artisanal communities themselves and sort of their agency in putting together these different um, traditions into an object. That, that's a great question. Um, 
This is a, a major problem, as you're, you're probably aware, because the, the kinds of data we have, I mean, first of all, we're dealing with fragments, we're dealing with lots of them, we're, we're in many cases lucky to have it. Um, I would say one area in which it arises, that you, there's some possibility of, of getting access to it, is in terms of uh, architectural patronage. Because there, you know, we, we don't fully, in most cases, understand the mechanisms, the pragmatics of patronage, and what it means um, to be a patron, and how that relates to the thing that, that's built, that's created. Um, but you can work out, um, empirically, certain stages. So you can work out which parts of a building were built first. You can work out things like, let me give you a concrete example. Um, the first Friday mosque in Delhi, the Kutub Mosque, reused architectural elements, it's composed of reused architectural elements, on which there's a, a, a wide variety of figurative imagery. So some, but not all of that, is defaced. Um, and clearly there's a sense that it's inappropriate to use that in the construction of a mosque. But if you look at uh, the manner of defacement, if you actually map it through the building, which you can do, um, you see patterns emerge, so there are clusters of defacings in certain ways. So I think from that, for example, you might deduce that the general uh, order is given to deface. But the manner of defacement is up to the agency of the mason or the uh, supervisor of the major mason, because you know, again, we were dependent on these. So there are ways where you can begin to, but it's, we, in most cases, we don't have uh, the data. But we have flotsam, and of course, it's elite flotsam that tends coins, and so I mean, the, the, the nature of the data is skewed. Mm -hmm. okay, so we have one more subject, and then we've got a question in the back. So we'll uh, this is just a comment, uh, and uh, particularly to Barry and perhaps to Pavishi as well. Um, uh, thank you for a fabulous uh, presentation. But uh, uh, on your last point about East Africa, I certainly feel that uh, it points us to a way of thinking about Asia which is uh, not bounded as you recommended. Uh, but, uh, but there's a bit of a challenge, uh, although I completely agree with the non-bounded part, as to how else to think of it. And I think one of the things that Hamashita says, uh, says his uh, presentation uh, revealed also are these interlinked uh, networks, right, which have different cores and different peripheries, and uh, and so, which then brings us also back to uh, different periodizations. At different <laughs> times, these are either homogenized or there is a greater concentration and some core which draws the other cores, and that is, I think, uh, the kind of provisional way in which we're thinking about interasia. It's all about how. Uh, groups. In fact, right now, you know, one of the things I was thinking is that ASEAN has become so central in uh, uh, in the concept of Asia that everybody is stumbling over to become part of this uh, larger Asia thing. Right? So it's an interesting moment once again in in what this kind of thing means. So I think it's also a very interesting way to think about uh, these uh, intersecting networks and uh, conjuring. I think that's exactly the way to go. And in a way, if you think to uh, back to Janet Abu Nagod, that's what she was suggesting. That's exactly how she diagrammed it. So as long as you have, as it were, that circle um, to the west that is enabled to then intersect. And the other thing is, of course, these, as you said, these change through time. If you map this across the long durée, you will get big and large, and you will get a very different pattern. The other thing to say is that we've been talking really all afternoon about maritime connections. If we were to do this thinking about terrestrial connections, we would have a very different kind of, kind of picture of that. But Abu Lubang has uh, the, the road links as well, mm -hmm. and she shows the dynamic interactions for that period. We really need something more complex, which would probably have to be done virtually for the later periods. And really across the long delay. Yeah, across the long delay. Three questions back here. One, two, three. Do I turn to the back? One by one? Okay, so we'll start. Thank you for uh, giving your attention for Maritime Asia again and the fascinating trade that were. And you showed us an, uh, a nice overview of all the um, tributary goods. 
and you devote a lot of attention to the Sapa mood. But I wonder uh, what happened with the Aga mood or the Wadegle or the Eagle mood that has been transported by the Dutch East India Company as uh, a precious good uh, for, uh, among uh, Asian nations to exchange even between the Dutch and the Vietnamese. Aga wood was a uh, very important uh, and, uh, good. And how was it with the Hukyu Islands? Is that, is that omitted from your list or is it just too tiny that it uh, did not have enough weight to be mentioned? Thank you very much. I, I have no peculiar information about that from Ryukyu document, but uh, Spanish document referring to Ryukyu also more than 60 uh, record, mostly uh, geographical record, but uh, some refer reference to uh, mixture with Chinese merchant with uh, bullion trade. And thinking about Dutch East India Company based on Batavia uh, might circulate this range. So maybe I, I, I should overlap without differentiating. Thank you very much, Paul. A question for Anton Ho. Um, I was not wholly convinced of the additional utility of the transregional over the global, just to take a couple of your examples. I mean, Gandhi seems to me to be understood in terms of his British education, his South African experience, his links to a Russian writer in Tolstoy. Seems to me that's more of a global analysis. And then he raised also finance. Um, I mean, clearly that's a global world, the links between Shanghai, um, uh, Hong Kong, London, New York, elsewhere, uh, the way uh, minerals corporations, other multinational corporations use offshores in Cayman Islands, many Western places, the British Virgin Islands, Cyprus. So it seems to me that in that sense, in those many in the cases you, you're picking up actually, still we, we, a global frame is necessary to really capture the totality of these things. Uh, but, but perhaps you could just clarify what you meant by transregional, how, how it is distinct from the global in that respect. Sure. With respect to, to um, Gandhi and uh, or Ed Sanjit Sin also, um, I have uh, trouble visualizing a Gandhi or a Sanjit Sin simply put, collecting money from globally, from all these players all over the world. They work through more specific, more concrete channels which they were very familiar with of, in Gandhi's case, Gujarati Banias, with Ahmedabad as a key center. And so he worked through these people who were very, on the one hand, very close to him socially. On the other hand, they, as a diasporic mercantile community, was out there, yes, uh, with perhaps the world as the hinterland. I wouldn't say the world, I would say, you know, Gujarat's uh, hinterland, which goes to East Africa and elsewhere, of course, but this Gujarati uh, uh, strand. Uh, similarly, for Sanya Sen, I know I'm from Penang, I would say. Uh, in Penang, there are many people who hold, um, or how do you call it, bonds or contracts given by Sun Yat Sen uh, to say that if you support my revolution now, uh, when we succeed, you will have these licenses for these things. Very, very specific, very specific thing. So these are very specific channels of mobilizing uh, resources, in this case financial resources, promises I will use which he could give to these people who partly said, yes, it's a high risk thing, but I'm not doing it just for the money, I'm doing it for, uh, to help my nation, China, and so on. I don't see a, a, a banker in Antwerp, for example, buying one of these uh, bonds. So, so I think uh, that intermediate level still is, uh, makes a lot of sense when you're actually trying to do things. You're trying to do things. I have also a question for uh, Einstein Hall. Uh, sort of similar. But I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about the scope of your prescriptions. I, mean, I, I took your critique, um, I mean, it was very well taken. But I was wondering if you were saying we need these concepts and methods if we wish to, if our purpose is to map inter Asian connections versus a more universal prescription, that this is what we should be doing generally. But to take the figure of Gandhi again, I mean, I couldn't understand Gandhi's political thought unless I understood his travels and influences and engagements in London and with writers of various types of experience in South Africa. But equally, I couldn't understand his political strategies and their effects in India, or British colonial India at the time, unless I understood, of course, his engagements 
there, in particular in a particular time, a particular place, and how we vernacularize certain ideas. Mm -hmm. So it seems to obviously be the case that depending on what questions you're asking, then certain frames or logics of inquiry will be more or less appropriate. So I guess the question is, are you, I, I think you're not saying you supplant one with another. Um, so then the question is, how, how do we choose, um, is it simply driven by the questions we're asking, that these are the types of methods we should explore, or do you have a, do you have a larger sort of, uh, I don't know, an understanding of how these logics and methods and scales of inquiry uh, can be integrated? Um, let me just uh, uh, start responding by saying that, the, giving you a caveat that um, the, the, what I'm saying only applies to this Western tradition of social theory. That is essentially what I know. Uh, you have people working with Ibn Khaldunian things, Islamic social sciences, Confucian, Zhangshu derived uh, social theories and so on. Uh, I don't know how to work with them and I haven't uh, really uh, uh, seen or met uh, people working on these things who have taught me how to, how to use them. So it is within, uh, the critique is within this tradition of Western uh, social theory and um, I think there is some, uh, um, there is uh, um, one of the important things in dealing with this or any sort of social theory is that you have to be aware of the conditions of production of the theory. If you don't control the theory, the theory controls you. So this is essentially an attempt, a reflective attempt to not let the theory control you. And to go back to the conditions of production of theory, essentially to say what path it went along and what alternative paths can it go along within the constraints of this, this, this tradition. And so I think it is within the constraints of this tradition that I've tried to identify specifically uh, how we got onto this trajectory. And within the broader range of concepts, this tradition also uh, gives us how one could possibly take other paths. And so the critique is aimed at I would say social sciences in general and history, art history, which are part of the enterprise. Um, and the inter-Asia part comes in uh, to say that um, this inter-Asia agenda and program we have uh, actually gives us specific advantages if we want to rethink and redo this tradition of Western social science. So that's where the thinking is. Yeah, this is for Professor Hamash. Uh, uh, you know, you have spent decades working on this fabulous project. Can you hear? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, on the tributary system, um, you know, different circles, you know, uh, decorating, you know, the Chinese periphery. And, and, um, and you say it's political, cultural, it's a political, cultural, uh, economic, and military dimensions, right? That, that certain circuits and, and routes and, and generates others. And so, and, and you know, I'm no historian, so, uh, you know, but, but I'm, I'm interested in whether you see there's any application, ideological application, or even practical application of this tributary mode uh, in a relationship between China and Africa. Because we're all you know, trying to figure out what's going on, how to understand the kinds of arrangements beyond the usual charges of neocolonialism and so on. Uh, do you have any sense at all of whether Chinese uh, politicians, uh, leaders, go back to this kind of historical paradigm uh, to, to inform some of their actions and understanding of, of being a global power? It's very difficult question to answer. I can say something, but uh, I wonder whether uh, it's really a uh, politician uh, in the current world or current China. And I know some uh, recovery of tributary relation or tributary system as a world, but seemingly it is mostly 
uh, confined within diplomatic relations. Uh, so uh, we need much more uh, synthesized way of discussion of uh, uh, tributary uh, relation, uh, so-called, uh, I, I, I try to call uh, as a system, as a whole. So it's not just separated into diplomatic and also culture or something. So it's a sort of mingled together, a mi mixture of the uh, integration of a sort of uh, world uh, within their perception. Okay, it's my turn. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm very grateful for obvious reasons to the three papers we, we heard, and I would like to attempt a, a, a small uh, a comment. Uh, uh, namely, uh, and I would like to attempt also a, a translation uh, for my own sake into um, my um, philosophical language, because I am a, a philosopher of whatever has been said here. I think indeed that uh, inter-Asia is a chance for all, all of us to uh, get out of the epistemological uh, deadlock, deadlock we have been in, and w which, is, uh, which has become obvious to everyone uh, uh, nowadays. I think it is also a chance to uh, uh, relate uh, um, getting out of this uh, deadlock uh, to uh, practical political questions of uh, how to deal with uh, uh, um, obviously uh, political, economic, social questions and problems that we face and that uh, uh, Asia uh, faces, but generally that uh, humankind uh, faces. Now, uh, I think that uh, inter-Asia and Asia as a whole it is a chance because uh, uh, we see, it, and at this conference we have seen it, as open in all directions, uh, both uh, inside and outside, and inside out. Uh, and um, I would like to uh, compare it to one uh, attempt, epistemological attempt recently of opening uh, Europe uh, to uh, um, a mediation of that kind. There has been a, a, a proposal uh, by, uh, among others, uh, uh, Etienne Balibar, uh, French philosopher, uh, about seeing Europe, uh, Europe becoming modest, right? Seeing Europe now as uh, uh, what uh, he called a, uh, a mediator, but uh, um, um, a vanishing mediator. Right. He takes the um, um, term from um, uh, Jameson and so on, never mind. And I think that this uh, uh, medi mediation, vanishing med mediation, where the mediator would vanish once accomplished, having accomplished the task of, of mediating, uh, is a very tri a tricky uh, 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 Thing because uh, uh, I'm not sure that the mediator would want to, to, uh, to vanish. Uh, uh, so uh, we can see the limits e uh, even of uh, the best proposals that come out of that uh, um, epistemological deadlock. Now, maybe we have a better chance here uh, with uh, um, Asia, also because uh, hey, Asia, in a way, doesn't have a concept of itself as uh, many people said here, there is not even uh, a, a name uh, uh, for Asia, and there is not necessarily this re relating to uh, the other as as, uh, as as the origin of uh, of, uh, of of our being Asian. Uh, so uh, this openness of the concept of Asia and inter Asia is really a a chance both epistemologically, both politically uh, and socially and whatever you will. Uh, the problem will remain the same as in other cases of other uh, theories linking the epistemological to the practical political, uh, which means that the question of uh, uh, resistance will uh, 
be there, will remain there, and will uh, be a case-by-case -case, uh, question also. And this is why, uh, why uh, inter-Asia is a chance. Inter-Asia is also not a guarantee forever. And uh, not being a guarantee forever is, for us, a chance again, epistemologically and politically. This is how I see it. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody can respond? Um, uh, thanks for your question. I, I would um, think of your question in terms of um, life worlds of action, on the one hand, versus large-scale systems of representation, on the other hand. And uh, I think uh, attempts like Balibar's to give us some uh, overarching concept, which sounds a lot to me like uh, Gramsci's concept, the hegemon, which the hegemon uh, rules but does not govern. Hegemon really is not seen. Anyway, this is an idea to give us a large-scale concept to cover a lot of, of ground. I think what is interesting about InterAsia and this whole project uh, we are involved in is that the action, the activity, we think goes beyond, beyond the existing uh, systems of large-scale representation we know. So I, I tried to speak about one of them. There are, there are others. Many come from, let's say, a, a, a European system, let's say, Westphalian state system, and international law from brochures and so on. There are large-scale, you, the Europeans have been very good at giving us large-scale representations of action. But they don't always fit perfectly. So to give you one example, uh, the British. The British are not total philosophers like the Continentals, but they are very good in matching worlds of action with uh, lower level ideologies. So what we see in this whole uh, Riku network, I was quite interested and happy to see Professor Hamashi that put the Hokkien's at the sort of center of the action. <laughs> the Hokkien's are not even considered Han Chinese by the, uh, by the Northerners. And so there's this whole realm of activity uh, Changing Kong is a nice uh, icon for this. His plan A was to get China, plan B was to get Japan and so on. So this whole geography, uh, yes, the Chinese tributary system has one way of representing this whole geography, but as we see, completely inadequately, completely inadequately. And so I think there's the, the gap between uh, this large-scale system of relocation and these large-scale systems of actions, which are not fully represented, gives us a lot of a lot of room for play, and I think it is part of the British genius to have identified these sorts of groups, like the Gujaratis, like the overseas Chinese, and so on, people with, let's say, economic power, but no political power or vehicle, to give them some kind of vehicle and establish a partnership which actually can be quite long-lasting, uh, powerful, yet not have that great uh, huge flags that uh, the Chinese and the Catholic Church might have. Thank you very much. I do realize there are a couple more questions out there, but we are well into tea break now, so I hope that maybe we can continue some of the conversations more informed outside. I'd just like to, before we adjourn, thank all three of our speakers for three very exciting <laughs>